What is going on, beautiful people? It is Bet Slam with Sam, and uh, I'm just doing a quick event recap for UFC Vegas 97, Gilbert Dorino Burns versus Sean Brady. Guys, there was a lot to unpack here, so I've got notes. They're on my phone, and I will be reading from them because I don't want to wait till later. I don't want to memorize everything. I'm just going to read through what I got here and get it across to you because I just sat through, watched all of the fights, not live because I did work today. And so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to get out how I saw the event going and uh, how all the bets got done. So first off, Zygamantis from Masca in the early prelims, guys. He showed some resilience and creativity in the first round, even dealing the only real quantifiable damage in the form of a face-splitting elbow from bottom position. However, once put in a compromising position in the second round, Fletcher got to the hidden arm triangle and quickly got the tap in round two. And I know myself and a lot of others, the only bet that I had placed was for this fight to start round two. And in a separate bet, I also had over 1.5 rounds over two betting platforms. Starting round two hit, over 1.5 didn't. So didn't really make too much of a difference up or down in my, uh, my bankroll for that one. But I know some of the people that took the over 1.5 rounds did hurt on that one. Moving on, we had Andre Petrosky. Guys, as soon as I saw Dylan Budka on the scale, I reached out to my community. I put out a community post. If you follow this channel, you would have seen that I posted on the community to hammer Petrosky because Dylan Budka looked atrocious on the scale and I was already on the Petrosky side. And, uh, you know, Andre Petrosky, he blanketed Dylan Budka and showcased that Dylan Budka is simply not ready for the big show, 30-27. And one thing that I did want to highlight here is that Dylan Budka did not fight. Dylan Budka, once he got put down on the ground, did not attempt to get back up. He didn't put himself in a compromising position. He just rode out the rounds and said, okay, I'm just going to take my L. And that honestly didn't sit too well with me. I definitely don't think it's going to sit too well with the matchmakers. So I wouldn't be surprised if he had his roster spot cut before he even made his way out of the octagon. And then we had Jacqueline Amora. You know, oh, I do want to go back a second. <laughs> Andre Petrosky, look, I had a heavy bet on Andre Petrosky on the money line. I parlayed his money line with others, such as Sean Brady and other people that I'll get on with later in the event. Uh, but I did also have some plays on him inside the distance. And if it was for Dylan Budka actually trying to fight, I think Petrosky could have found their finish. But Dylan Budka just gave no resistance, gave no opportunity for the submission, just laid flat on his back. So it is what it is, you know. Dylan Budka did a terrible job. Petrosky did what he did to win, but otherwise didn't impress me too much. Then we had Jacqueline Amorum versus Vanessa Demopoulos. And immediately, round one, Jacqueline Amorum got on top of Vanessa Demopoulos and, you know, worked through multiple positions before Vanessa exploded in an attempt to get out of here, which Dylan Budka didn't do. You know, Vanessa was trying to win. And uh, Vanessa exploded. The Amorim put those hooks in, and she was hooking Demopoulos' glove. She even, in the post-fight interview, said she wasn't. You could see three fingers in the glove deep in there doing that Islam Makachev glove hook in which we love to see uh you know and you could hear Vanessa Demopoulos screaming look she's grabbing my glove she's grabbing my glove and I do agree with Dominic Cruz saying look you got to fight the armbar you got to fight yourself out of the position it's not the referee's job to stop things you know yes if something ultimately is a foul or gets caught you know they will deal with it accordingly but it's your job to fight until the referee stops it not the other way around you know you're not supposed to be getting the referee involved and so you know she she got armbarred and whether or not she was going to escape that round, escape the position without it, I definitely think that her attention being divided didn't help. And, you know, maybe she could have extended that fight if she didn't uh, focus on that. So annoying that she was hooking her glove, but ultimately Vanessa Demopoulos let herself down by putting her attentions to that rather than defending the position. So it is what it is. Uh, Jacqueline Amorum, pretty heavy favorite, gets it done. I did pick uh, Vanessa Demopoulos and I said, look, it's, it's about the odds. You know, Vanessa Demopoulos, if this fight extends, she's live on the scorecards. And I do believe that if that fight went past the first round, those uh, the submissions aren't as readily available. And uh, Vanessa Demopoulos would have become a live dog. We didn't get there. You know, Jacqueline Warren got it done in round one. Good for her. And then we had Yiza versus Gabriel Santos, guys. Yiza, if you haven't seen this fight, go watch it. Yiza is a dog. For me personally, this was my fight of the night. I know that Jessica Andrade uh, down the line versus Natalia Silva was also a banger, and we'll get to that. But Yiza ate some shit, man. You know, Round one, Santos swarmed Yiza with a barrage of high kicks and combinations, catching him with a devastating front kick that was very reminiscent of that Michael Chandler versus Tony Ferguson. And uh, this is where we found out just how dangerous Gabriel Santos really is because 
with a step down in competition, which Yiza is to the past two fights that Gabriel Santos has had, you know, with Lerone Murphy, you know, so, uh, you know, Yiza, tough dude, but he got outclassed, got out grappled, had a big cut on his head, and ultimately 30 26, 30 26, 30 27. Uh, you know, I was on Yiza for the value side. I thought that if he extended this fight, he would be able to start taking over with the grappling and whatnot. But Gabriel Santos improved since his last fight. This was not the same version of him. He was defensively more sound and he was active as hell. And he was trying to get things going the entire fight. And uh, I really thought that, that was a, an awesome performance from Gabriel Santos. But it also gave me some positives for Yiza. And I think there are winnable matchups for him down the line. This was a pretty tough UFC entry fight for him. But, you know, it was a good measuring stick for the both of these guys. So we know where Yiza is at now. We know where Gabriel Santos is. So pretty exciting stuff to see. Then we had Felipe Dos Santos versus Andre Lima. Guys, round one, Felipe Dos Santos was looking very sharp. He was counter-punching, and uh, he, he caught Andre Lima with a lot of shots, you know. And even when Andre Lima was pressing forward a lot, he was actually just eating more shots than he was giving. But he was trying to play that pressure game. And the part where the fight got a little bit slippery is when Felipe Dos Santos used a big explosion of energy, you know, to try and dump Andre Lima onto the ground. And they were by the fence, and Andre Lima very clearly grabbed the fence, which was what kept him grounded, stopped the takedown. I would have liked to have seen the referee either take a point or award the position because it was pretty clear that, you know, he was about to get dumped on his butt and then a very hard fence grab that everybody saw. The commentary team saw it. The referee saw it. I, I felt like the, they could have intervened, you know. When something is that blatant and that uh, interfering of the action, I think that it needs to be addressed. You know, Felipe won round one. But I think he had to use more energy to get it done uh, because of that foul. And I think that it should have been a point deduction or a change of the position. But nothing being done about it. Ultimately, it is what it is. Round two, Lima fair and square gets the takedown secured position for the majority of the round. One round two. And then in round three, you know, it was on the feet. Felipe started doing okay. Ultimately, uh, Lima scores the position and rides it out. You know, it is what it is. Two rounds to one. It, a little bit of a blemish for me on Lima. I felt like it was a pretty dirty, you know, blatant fence grab. And I thought that the referee should have stepped in and did something about it because how does it uh, showcase to the rest of the fighters? Look, you can just blatantly do at least one hard foul per fight and, and we'll just, you know, whatever. So ultimately annoyed by that one. I was on the Felipe Dos Santos side, but even if I was on the Lima side, I wouldn't have been too impressed with that fence grab. So it is what it is. Then we had Isaac Dolgarian. Guys, Isaac Dolgarian, if you did not know, was one of the biggest betting favorites of all time. Not just this year, not just on this card, like of all time. And uh, that's a lot of pressure to ride on your shoulders because he's still fighting a man with two hands and a head, you know? And uh, he wasted zero seconds though. Isaac Dolgarian, touch gloves, hit him with the combination, straight into the takedown. I didn't even know if the clock had, had taken a second down. Uh, gets the dude down, lands about 50 strikes on top, rode out all of round one, and uh, racked up over four and a half minutes of control time. So very dominant round one. Round two began, and Dolgarian shoots a takedown. Again, less than one second then. Ended up in mount and did get elbowed in the head and ate a few shots on his way in, started bleeding, but ultimately worked his way towards that submission. He hit an arm triangle position. We did have a bet on uh, Dolgarian by submission. It's the only action I had on this fight, so pretty fucking happy that that one cashed. Uh, I looked at his KO prop and it was minus money. And I was like, man, this guy has subs too. What are we doing here? So we picked the sub. Very happy to have got that one correct. Slam of the week time. Something I do want to address is I was on a slam of the week win streak. I picked wrong Jew. Wrong Jew should have had right to. You know, <laughs> wrong fighter. Uh, ultimately, wrong Jew though, he looked good. I, I, I don't want to sit here and act like Rongju was losing this fight in any huge capacity. It was a competitive fight, and there was a huge shot landed, huge elbow from Chris Taco Padilla. You know, Rongju blatantly took round one. Like, that was Rongju round one. I think all three judges' scorecards probably would have had it as round one. I think round two was pretty competitive up until the elbow, and so that round was still on the table. So as far as I'm concerned, no one really clearly distinguished themselves up until the point of the elbow, but that was a fight ender. You know, one monstrous elbow that landed on his eye and imploded his eye, made it look like an anime beatdown, something you'd see on Dragon Ball Z. Uh, it was kind of crazy. So, Slam of the Week gets smoked. And if you didn't know, uh, Jacob, 
JK, the freckled salamander, over on We Want Picks. His official lock of the week was Chris Taco Padilla. So I officially take an L directly to Jacob there. So well done. Uh, congratulations to you on your continued success on lock of the week. You know, but then we move on. We had Trevor Peak versus Yanal Ashmus. And all week I'd been saying that Yanal Ashmus was the uh, more skilled athlete and the better martial artist. Those were my words. I said that Trevor Peak is uh, incredibly tough, hits hard, but he is not a, a great skilled mixed martial artist. And he's trying to improve. Like he, he must be a, an absolute workhorse in the gym because for a guy who started with very little skills, he's picking them up along the way. You know, he's fighting and he's learning on the job. But the fight sort of started off and Yanil Ashmus, you know, he was playing the Matador. He was circling around and ultimately when uh, Trevor Peak would load up on those big, he really reaches in his back pockets for those shots. And when he, he uh, signaled to Yanal Ashmus that he was doing that, Yanal waits, he swings, he ducks, he takes the legs. And this happened multiple times. And I could sit here and talk about this fight till I'm blue in the face, you know, going uh, this, that, all the intangibles. But ultimately, it was that. Yanal Ashmus blended the arts better than Trevor Peak, and that is why he won. You know, nine takedowns, solidified the fight with a takedown in the third round as well. Yanal Ashmus won a unanimous decision as an underdog pick. So I picked a lot of underdogs this week and a lot of them burned me. Yanil Ashmoz, he was not one of them. Speaking of underdog picks, Matt Snell had a last minute, uh, four days I think it was, uh, change of opponent to Cody Durden. And I, I, I stuck with Matt Snell because I was on Alessandro Acosta, but with the short notice that Cody Durden had, I had some chin concerns because he brutally got KO'd uh, from Bruno Silva. You know, I, I wondered what sort of fight shape he was in. And in the first round, when Matt Snell came out, he was beating the piss out of Cody Durden in a, and I'm, I'm not saying it was one-way traffic, but he was definitely getting the better of those exchanges. We can all agree that uh, Matt Snell won round one. He had Cody Durden stumbled and crumbled twice. There were two times where you could see shaky legs from Cody Durden. But ultimately, uh, in the second round, Matt Snell shoots a blast double, and it was the first takedown shot of the round from either people. And Matt Schnell, you know, he shoots him for the double. Cody Durden sprawls, snatches up the neck, and an anaconda choke. That is a wrap. He, and Matt Schnell tried to get out of it. You know, he rolled. He rolled one way. He did the other thing. He realized, oh, fuck, I'm running out of air. This is getting tighter. And he tapped. There's no shame in it. I do want to quickly point out, Matt Schnell did retire. And, you know, it looked like it kind of went a little bit unnoticed. And I just want to say, you know, Matt Schnell, if by some chance you watch this, you know, I appreciate you and I appreciate you always putting on exciting performances for us and all the fighters. Honestly, every single UFC fighter that goes out there, every single fighter, you know, no matter what caliber I call them, you know, I'm just a guy sitting here. I love the fights. I love that I get to, to bid on the fights, watch the fights, have something to do on Sundays. You know, it's Sunday New Zealand time. I know it's Saturday in other parts of the world. But, you know, I just want to say that any fighter deserves my respect. And I do wish that he got a little uh, interview because I would have loved to have heard what he had to say. But, you know, Matt Schnell, thank you for the fights. We move on. Uh, you know, Steve Garcia. Guys, I started writing a little spiel for this, but ultimately Steve Garcia, he started that fight in a poor position, did a good job getting the reversal, but it was very tainted, that finish, because... Steve Garcia gets on top, lands about eight strikes to the back of the head of Kyle Nelson, and a couple of them big elbows, and there's no arguing that they were to the back of the head because Kyle Nelson's head was stationary, and Steve Garcia lines it up, crashes an elbow, creates a huge welt at the base of the back of his head. Um, big, big, ugly asterisk on that one for me. You know, Steve Garcia had a lot of momentum riding for this. I guess he's going to continue riding that with that one. Some people are trying to say that, you know, it didn't, didn't impact things too greatly. I think that's bullshit. I think getting struck directly to the back of the head really fucking rocks people's shit. So I don't know what Carl Nelson's going to say about it. But for me, I'm not sitting there celebrating. And I don't think that Steve Garcia deserved a performance of the night bonus like he got. I think that that performance of the night bonus definitely should not have gone to him. and should have gone to Chris Padilla. Somebody that, you know, was using skill and lined up a beautiful shot causing the doctor stoppage finish. Whereas Steve Garcia, you know, just elbowing somebody in the back of the head in a compromised position. Cool. You know, it is what it is. Call me a hater, whatever. You know, Steve Garcia, not my favorite flavor today. You know, very unsportsmanlike to 
kind of just act like that didn't even happen as well in his post-fight interview. But it's his moment. It is what it is, you know. Then we had Natalia Silva taking on Jessica Andrade. This fight was a banger. It really was. And Jessica Andrade brought it, man. She she came forward, all five foot one of her or five foot two, whatever she is. Little demon coming forward and throwing hooks, bringing the fight. All 15 minutes of it was constant action because Jessica Andrade didn't take a backward step. And, uh, you know, Natalia Silva was there for it. You know, she, even though you could tell that the pressure was mounting sometimes, she stayed offensive. She did damage. She won all the rounds. It was beautiful stuff and a great fight and a great test to see really where she truly belongs in the division. So I think that Silva is for real now. And uh, the starting talks of her going for a title shot, right there, man. She is right up there because anytime you beat one of these former um, title challenges and title holders, you know, that's that's a big feather in your cap and it, it's a big performance to have to go through an entire fight like that. It wasn't like she got some early stoppage, you know. She went through 15 minutes of Jessica Andrade hunting her down. So we know that Silva's for real now. So let's talk about some big matchups for her. Then in the main event, guys, it was Sean Brady versus Gilbert Burns. And I tell you what, round one, I was like, hell yeah, Sean Brady's got this. I bet on Sean Brady. I picked Sean Brady. I had Sean Brady on the money line paired with Natalia Silva by decision. Uh, that bet did hit. But ultimately, man, like Gilbert Burns, he is a dog. And I was discrediting him a little bit leading into this. Not because I dislike him. Not because I don't think he's a skilled person. But he is old. You know, he is old. And he has taken a lot of damage in his career. There are a lot of miles on the clock for Gilbert Burns. It's not just about how old you are. It's how young you were when you started. How many fights have you done? How many finishes have you suffered? You know, how many wars have you been through? And the truth is that Gilbert Burns has been in a lot of wars. He's taken a lot of damage. He's been finished on multiple occasions, but he's still just right there, man. Like, even in this fight, it was a game of inches. And yes, Sean Brady ultimately did outstrike him, get more control time, all the rest of it, you know, won the fight all but every single, you know, few minutes of the fight were Sean Brady, but it was competitive all the way through. You know, Sean Brady had to work for every takedown. There was no free minutes given to him. You know, there was no Gilbert Burns quit. So I thought that Gilbert Burns uh, really, really represented him well in that fight. And for Sean Brady, great performance. Um, I actually thought that he was going to have more success on the mat. So credit to Gilbert Burns, you know, proving to be difficult, proving to be a struggle to hold down. And uh, ultimately, I just want to say this was a great fight card, you know. Free fight night, great matchmaking, a lot of competitive matchups. Uh, I really enjoyed the whole thing. And uh, even with all the little asterisks, you know, the, the glove holds. The, there's always a bit of niggle in these UFC fight cards, but ultimately I enjoyed the entire thing. As far as the bets went, you know, we went four for four, slight profit. Uh, I personally profited a little bit more than the bet card because I loaded up on a few spots, but, uh, you know, we move. I hope you all enjoyed the fights, and uh, if you want to let me know in the comments your favorite fight of the night, mine personally was Yiza versus Gabriel Santos. Until then, I'll see you all for uh, Slam of the Week tomorrow, and then Dana White's Contender Series picks. I got my ass handed to me on last week's uh, Dana White Contender Series, so this week, we're coming back with a vengeance, baby. I'll see you all in the next one.